give a big welcome to Tim for coming along. Thank you very much. Okay. And for everyone else, um, if you have any questions, if you can keep them till the end, there's going to be a dedicated Q&A time at the end. And time is not such a big issue for us because we've got the buffer zone at the end before the plenary. So all that being said, I'm going to get out of the way and hand it over to Tim. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, so my name's Tim Andrew Wather. I work at the British Council in Japan. Uh, I mainly work off-site uh, at a university, but I also work at the British Council School in Tokyo uh, teaching adults. And before I worked at the British Council, I worked uh, at another English conversation school in Japan. Uh, so my presentation is called A Global Approach in the Eikaiwa community. So Eikaiwa are the uh, English conversation schools in Japan. Okay, and this is the outline. So uh, I'm gonna talk about the need for change uh, in English language teaching. Uh, and then I'll introduce a global approach uh, which can be used to teach English in Eikaiwa. And then I will talk about some research uh, into learner attitudes towards the approach, uh, followed by some suggestions about how it can be implemented. And then finally, I'll make a call for change uh, in the way English is taught in Eikaiwa. Okay, so here is Katru's three circle model, which shows the spread of English. So there is the inner circle, uh, which is where English is used as a first language in countries like the UK and the US. And then there's the outer circle, which is uh, where English is used as a second language uh, in countries like India, Kenya, Singapore, etc. So in these countries, they use English as well as uh, local languages. Okay, and also there's the expanding circle, uh, which is where English is learned as a foreign language that includes uh, many countries such as Brazil, France, Japan, Russia, Thailand, etc. Uh, and as uh, English has spread around the world, uh, different varieties of English have developed and they are sometimes referred to as global Englishes. Uh, so, so with the spread of English, uh, around the world. Uh, now, the majority of speakers of English are multilingual and they, they use English as well as other languages. Uh, so there has been influence uh, from other languages and from many different cultures. So uh, uh, there have been changes in the way that English is used uh, and in the different places where English is used, uh, different varieties have developed and they have differences in uh, pronunciation and grammar and vocabulary. And some of these varieties are in specific places, so like Indian English or Singaporean English. So these are referred to as uh, world Englishes, but also uh, English is used as a global lingua franca. So for example, if someone from Brazil meets someone from France and someone from uh, Russia, uh, it's, it's, it's quite likely they might use English to communicate with each other. So this is called ELF, so uh, English is a lingua franca. Uh, however, uh, even though like English is spread and is used by many people in many different contexts, there is still uh, this preference for inner circle English uh, in, in uh, some parts of English language teaching. This is referred to as a native speakerism, uh, which is the belief that so-called native speakers are superior uh, in providing insights into the English language and the culture. And, and this is a major selling, selling point in the Eikaiwa schools in Japan. Uh, so Koba analyzed uh, Eikaiwa advertising and found that native speakerism was, was frequently used as a selling point 
uh, for Akaiwa. Okay, and the advertising, Akaiwa advertising suggests English belongs to the inner circle. And through exposure to native speakers, they can learn, learn real English. And th this, is, this is a problem considering the way English is used by people from many different cultures and also the, the way that it is it's being used in different ways which are different to how it's used in the inner circle. And there, there have been calls for change in English language teaching. Uh, so it's been argued that the materials are still dominated by English speakers from the inner circle. Uh, and they need to include more English speakers from the outer and expanding circles. And the learners need examples of uh, successful ELF encounters. So English is a lingua franca. Okay, and Rose, Rose and Galloway, uh, they, they say that commercial materials, uh, which have, you know, have people from different countries, it's, it's kind of unlikely at the moment uh, so, so they suggest that the solution is homegrown materials, so materials made by uh, students, sorry, by teachers, okay, and uh, changes, they, they say that changes are occurring at a grassroots level in uh, teachers' own classrooms. Uh, there have also been calls for change in a Kaiwa. And a global approach has been suggested uh, for which could be used in a Kaiwa, which uh, which combines global Englishes and intercultural communication. And the aim is to prepare learners to communicate with uh, people uh, all over the world. And, and this this approach is aimed at uh, adult learners, I should say. So here is the global approach. So yeah, it includes global Englishes, uh, which, which is focusing more on the different varieties of English, including world Englishes and English as a lingua franca. Uh, also, the approach uh, combines intercultural communication. And so intercultural communication is about people from different cultures uh, communicating and yeah, the focus is more on the culture. Uh, and by combining global Englishes and intercultural communication, they can, they can uh, uh, learn how to communicate with people all over the world. Uh, but of course, it's important to, to consider the attitudes of the learners. Uh, so some research was conducted uh, in an Akaiwa school and 84 adult students uh, participated in the, in the study, which took part in an Akira in Tokyo. And the majority of the, the participants were studying English at higher levels. And they had no experience of, of the global approach when, when the uh, research was carried out. And the, the research uh, measured their attitudes towards uh, listening to people from all over the world and also learning about cultures from all over the world. So as I said earlier, native speakerism is a big part of the uh, kind of advertising and a major selling point in Akaiwa. So it, it was unsurprising that uh, the research uh, showed a slightly negative attitude towards uh, listening to people from all over the world. So, so uh, they have a, it kind of showed there was like a preference uh, for listening to people from the inner circle. However, when it came to learning about cultures from all over the world, uh, the research showed a clearly positive attitude. So, so, so it was felt that overall, uh, this approach could be implemented uh, in the Akaiwa context with, with higher level, higher level adult learners. So uh, I'd like to make some suggestions for change, which which could be done uh, in the Akaiwa context. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, how changes could be made top down from management, 
and then, then I'll talk about what teachers can do themselves. So uh, some of the Akaiwa schools make their own uh, in-house textbooks. So this gives them a really good uh, opportunity to, to make changes. So they, yeah, they should update the in-house textbooks and they should include speakers uh, from the outer and expanding circles uh, in the listening. Uh, also the contexts should show cultural diversity. Okay, so for example, uh, I'm gonna show you some, some photos that, that I took uh, and uh, I want you to write in the chat box if you have some ideas. So where do you think these pictures were taken? And how would English be used in this context? So yeah, if you have any ideas, write in the chat box. So they're all taken in the same place. <laughs> okay. Any other ideas? Okay. So these pictures were taken. I'm just checking the chats. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, one suggestion is Vietnam and also lingua franca. Another suggestion is Hawaii. Okay, yeah, good suggestions. So yeah, Vietnam is very close because these uh, pictures were actually taken uh, in Thailand, yes. So someone has just uh, said Thailand. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they were taken in Thailand and yeah, on uh, Koh Samui. And yes, uh, we can expect English to, to be used as a lingua franca. Um, tourism is a very important industry uh, in, in Thailand. So many people come from many different countries. Of course, at the moment, because of the pandemic, it's, it's kind of uh, is stopping people moving around. But hopefully, hopefully things will return to normal. And yeah, so usually when many people are visiting, then uh, English is used uh, for, you know, for, for communication between people from many different places. Okay, so yeah, it was, pictures were taken in Thailand, tourism is important. And so we can expect that uh, English as a lingua franca and also intercultural communication uh, are likely in this context. And at the uh, Akaiwa school where, where I used to teach, uh, they, they made their, their own textbooks. Uh, and in one, one of the textbooks, which was an upper intermediate textbook, uh, it had a lesson which was set in Thailand. So that was, uh, you know, there was a really good opportunity to show intercultural communication and English as a lingua franca. Uh, however, uh, all, all the, actually all the speakers in the recording, they were all British. I think the context was like two British people were on holiday in Thailand and they were visiting two British people that lived there and they were discussing kind of what to do on their last night. And they're kind of talking in the same way they, they would in the UK. Uh, it kind of seems like this would be an unlikely situation for Japanese learners visiting Thailand. I kind of I felt that it would be more likely that they would be interacting with people from different countries and other people from the expanding circle. Uh, but, but of course, native speakerism is a big kind of selling point. So that's probably a big reason why, why they did that. Uh, but, but I do think that uh, this lesson should be redesigned to include speakers from the expanding circles. And it should, it should uh, have examples of successful ELF and also uh, successful intercultural communication. So what, what, what do I mean by successful ELF and su successful intercultural communication. So, so I'll t talk about that now and give some examples. Okay, so 
So English as a lingua franca is, is fluid and flexible, and it depends on the situation. So it depends who, who is talking to who. And that they, between them, they kind of negotiate the way that English is used. And they don't necessarily use it uh, in the same way that it's used in the inner circle. Because, yeah, communication is the most important thing rather than like sounding like a native speaker. And what one of the techniques that is used uh, is accommodation. So, so accommodating the person you're speaking to. Uh, for example, one, one uh, accommodation technique is to repeat something the interlocutor said. Uh, e even, even if it is different to, to native speaker norms, so it could be kind of different pronunciation or different grammar, different vocabulary. Uh, it could be, for example, using a uncountable noun as a countable noun, that kind of thing. Uh, and by, yeah, by sort of repeating it, then it creates alignment rather than correction. And that helps, that helps kind of uh, the communication. Okay, another technique that is used is uh, code switching. So that means uh, using different languages. And by, by doing this, uh, they can express things that can't be expressed in English. And they can create solidarity, solidarity as a multilingual, uh, as multilingual elf speakers. So, for example, if you had a Japanese person and a Thai person communicating, so they might they might be using English because they both know some English. But if the Japanese person knows a bit of Thai, he might also use that. If the Thai person also also knows some Japanese, then that might be used as well. Just a few, so mixing it in with the English, and that would also kind of help the communication. Okay, so I'll now look at successful intercultural communication. So, so first, uh, I mentioned about large culture and cultural resources. So according to Holiday, so large culture refers to kind of the national, national culture, so like British culture or Japanese culture or Thai culture. And the cultural resources are things like the media, uh, education, and religion, and those kind of things that influence people. Uh, and this can be where differences are found when people have different kind of cultural backgrounds. Uh, but but, uh, but uh, we are not defined by these influences. Uh, and actually, we all, we all belong to many small cultures. And even if someone is from a you know different different country or something, then still you might belong to some of the same small cultures, which could be related to your profession, or your interests. Could be related to music or many things like that. Okay, uh, and because we belong to many small cultures, uh, we have multiple cultural identities. So related to our profession or kind of our friends or hobbies. And depending who we speak to, we can kind of decide uh, which of our multiple kind of cultural identities would be suitable in that situation. And then we can choose which culture cards to play depending on the situation. And by doing that, we can find the threads that are connecting us. And that is, is uh, important in intercultural communication. OK, so yeah, I've talked about uh, how the lessons should be redesigned. So uh, the in-house textbooks can be redesigned. And they should include speakers from, well, from the outer circles and expanding circles, as well as from the inner circle. And it should show successful ELF, English as a lingua franca, and also successful intercultural communication. However, as I mentioned earlier, yeah, native speakerism is a major selling point in Akaiwa. 
so uh, it does seem unlikely that management will will make changes. I mean, I'm particularly thinking of kind of like the the bigger Eikaiwa schools, like the chains. Uh, I think it would be, yeah, maybe unlikely for them to do this. Uh, but don't worry, there is still hope. Uh, so I'm going to talk about how how teachers can can uh, can implement the approach. So bottom up from teachers, okay, and yeah, they should uh, produce their own homegrown materials which they can use in their classes, and uh, they can find uh, authentic listening on the internet, uh, which which is which is suitable with higher level students. So on the internet, there is there's so much uh, material like uh, from different countries. For for example, I think street interviews are really good. Street interviews uh, recorded in different countries discussing like different topics. Street interviews are good because usually there are many different opinions. So the students will kind of hear that even people who kind of are living in the same place will have different opinions and different views. So I think that works very well. So this is the kind of uh, authentic listening method that, that I've used in Aikawa classes. Uh, so the kind of first thing to do is to prepare authentic material. So to find our speakers from the in uh, out and expanding circles, talking about different cultural topics. Uh, then uh, it's good to give them the qu some questions to look at bef before they listen. So some pre-listening questions. So if it is a street interview, then you can make a note of the questions that are asked in the street interview, show the students and they kind of predict what they think the people will say. They try and see, thing try and see things from a different cultural perspective. Then they, they listen and make a note of the answers. And then finally, they, they can have a discussion and discuss if the answers were similar or different from their predictions or, or from their own cultural perspectives. And yes, like it's really good if they kind of find out that there are many different uh, ways of looking at things, even with people who are kind of living in the same, same kind of place. Uh, but when we choose uh, choose authentic like listening from the internet, uh, we do do need to be careful of cultural discourses. So Hol Holiday says, yeah, be aware of discourses in the media uh, because sometimes these kind of uh, yeah the way the way they show different cultures sometimes uh, exaggerates uh, cultural differences, uh, which could be a problem. And sometimes that is to kind of serve hidden agendas. So it's important to try and be aware of that, to try and avoid material that will, will uh, encourage stereotypes and that kind of thing. Yeah, we, we need to find like the threads connecting us uh, rather than the blocks separating us. Okay. So f finally, I'd like to make a call for change at the grassroots level. Uh, so I think uh, teachers need to take matters into their own hands and they need to produce uh, homegrown materials to use in the classroom. So yeah, I found uh, this, pic this, this is a picture I took uh, in Vietnam, but I thought it kind of shows the kind of different homegrown materials that, that uh, teachers can produce and bring into the classroom. And also they need to uh share the homegrown materials uh amongst the Aikaiwa community okay so and here are uh the references uh from my presentation so thank you very much for listening uh and i'll just stop sharing now okay uh and I, i've also got a handout uh which has some links for some authentic listening also has a link for the research that was that was done and also a link for an example of homegrown material uh, so i'm just gonna 
put the, is link the handout here. online. Maybe you could stick it in the chat thread. Oh, you got it. Perfect. Great. Yeah, it's a good, it's a Google Doc. So I've just popped it into the chat box. And yeah, that, that's uh, if anyone has any questions or any any comments, uh, I'd be very interested to hear. Uh, I have a quick question. Um, you mentioned some attitudes from learners about this kind of learning and English as a lingua franca. Do you have a sense that there's like a particular market emerging? I ask because in Korea, there's a lot of resistance to this kind of thinking, but also I think um, Koreans in their 20s and 30s who've had some experience of um, say international business have are very frustrated about how they weren't really prepared for using English as a lingua franca. So um, do you think, is there any kind of market shift happening in Japan? Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, in the research, uh, so, so yeah, the, like I, I did, I mentioned some research, which, which, which I did and, and, uh, in that, yeah, there were, it kind of showed kind of comp complicated attitudes where like for the listening, it kind of, it kind of showed that they kind of knew it was important to listen to people from different countries, but at the same time, they've got this preference. They were like, yeah, but I'd rather listen to inner circle English. It's kind of a bit of a conflicting uh conflicting attitudes or quite complex uh and when i did the research they hadn't sort of experienced the approach but i do know that there were students who told me they didn't want to listen to people from different countries but then we did it in the lesson and we talked about it and i could see the, the attitudes were changing through through discussion yeah, yeah. Thanks. I think, yeah, I think it's really similar in Korea. The at complicated attitudes that learners have are very similar. So does anybody, anybody else have any, any questions? Um, I was just looking through the link that you sent. What's an Angmo accent? Yeah, so that's in Singapore and uh, Angmo accent refers to they they say that referring to someone who has like like a British accent or American accent. It's like a non-Singaporean accent. So in in that particular video, it's a street interview in Singapore, and the interv interview is asking Singaporeans what do they think if they meet a Singaporean who doesn't sound singaporean mm, okay. they have like a, a a a western kind of accent and that, that is that yeah that is very interesting they i think generally in singapore from the interview they they're a bit negative if a singaporean doesn't sound singaporean they, they mm -hmm. think it's okay. important to show your your kind of singaporean identity well, kind of interesting because singaporeans tend to stick a la on the end of sentences and that could also be a scouser <laughs> so does anybody else have any questions or any other comments oh and i just noticed in the chat uh chioko mentioned about the website hello and yeah she asks if i've used that and yes i have that's a really good uh hello is a really good website uh, Elo has many uh, like one minute videos, people in different countries talking about different topics. I've been using that with my university classes. I, have, I, I did, haven't tried that in the Aikaiwa context, but it's really good in the, I've used in the university one. And that's, that's great. So does anybody else have any comments or questions? Okay. Well, thank thank you everyone for watching. I really appreciate you you coming into this Zoom room. So there's Thanks loads of other stuff great. going on. Right, let's have a big round of applause yeah. for Tim. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks to everyone else for coming. I'm going to stop the recording now.